We are in the last week of this series, Get Dusty, where we've been really diving into that ancient Jewish blessing that Jesus would have known about. It says, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. May you be so close to this rabbi, this Jesus, that it's almost like hard to tell the difference between you and him by the way that you see the world, the way that you uh, see other people, the way you use your words, by the way that you live. Uh, In different ways, each week, we've challenged you with this thought that our beliefs about Jesus are very important, um, but it's our actions that actually change the world. Uh, Think of it this way. Jesus didn't come to start a new religion. Jesus didn't come to get you to change your religious affiliation on Facebook or anything like that. No, Jesus came so that the up there would come down here. The kingdom of God would invade our, our space down here. This is what he's on about. This is what he's up to. And the scandal of it is that he's inviting you. He's inviting me, even though we're all a hot mess express and we've all got so many questions, maybe more questions than answers. He's inviting us to follow him. And this is what discipleship is actually all about. If you've grown up in church, um, like I grew up in church, and when I heard the word discipleship, I always thought it was just about going deep. It was about like knowing more stuff up here, like taking a class, taking a workshop so that we could become actual disciples of Jesus. But in the first century, uh, discipleship was not just about head knowledge. It was about being with your rabbi and then becoming like your rabbi. And that's the invitation that you and I have is to be with Jesus in our daily lives so that we become like him and we do the things that he did. So in this series, we, we've challenged each other to see the world through Jesus' lenses, to see the world with a good, abundant, generous eye, to see others through a good, abundant, generous eye, not a bad, stingy, evil, scarcity mindset, cynical lens. He said that the true life is found when you look at the world through generous Jesus eyes. Last week, we talked about our words and how our words are powerful. They create worlds for other people and for us to live in. So the way that we use our words is a sacred task. And we looked at Jesus and how he always used his words to lift people up and spoke words of life and hope into cynicism and despair. But he also used his words to point out the folly in religious people or gatekeepers shutting people out of what God was doing as well. And he was like an insult comic sometimes whenever anybody would stand in the way of his grace and access to him from other people. And we're called to do the same thing, to be dusty with our speech and be a voice for the voiceless. Today, we're going to talk about what it means to have dusty relationships, the kind of people that we spend time with and how we uh, have the dust of our rabbi, our Lord Jesus, in our relationships. So uh, I was thinking like one of the most powerful tools in building relationships and maintaining relationships is the table, isn't it? Like there's something sacred, something beautiful about having friends and family around a table where there's good food, good drink, great dessert that everybody feels a little guilty about, but we indulge it anyway. And there's great conversation and openness and trust that's built in these relationships. I mean, we have the American picture of the dinner table from Norman Rockwell, right? Isn't this exactly what your home looks like on a Tuesday night? Oh, it just looks like, and look like the one glaring thing that's just way out of whack is there's no smartphones on the table at all. People are like listening to each other intently with smiles. Like, what is this, right? I mean, we think like this is what the table should be in cultivating beautiful and meaningful relationships. Um, But often it doesn't play out this way, right? I mean, just (laughs) verbatim in our house, uh, Megan and I were just realizing the last couple weeks that um, the table for us is not a place of peace between like 5.30 and 7 because we have a one-year-old and a three-year-old. It's like a stinking war zone every single night, like, you know, like where we are like shoveling food into our mouths so that we can attend to our two kids as quick as possible. We went to a nice dinner a couple weekends ago and we were like embarrassed. Megan was like kicking my leg from under the table because we were like done with our food before anybody else had like really gotten into theirs because we're so used to eating at like a breakneck pace to make it happen, right? And there's these moments when you have toddlers and if you don't remember this, um, I don't like you very much, just kidding. Um, But no, that was a joke. Uh, but like you have these moments where your kids start like cry screaming in unison. Like just one's upset, but the other one's like, this sounds like fun. Cry, scream, cry, scream. And there are these moments when Megan and I just look at each other and it's like just craziness. And like we just start dying laughing because you gotta laugh so you don't cry kind of thing. Uh, and it's like the, like the least peaceful moment of my day is when we are sitting at the table. 
And that's not the way it's supposed to be, but it, it brings a level of awkwardness and attention to our dinner table. And I know it's just a season. It just seems like a long season right now. <laughs> but there's some other awkwardness that comes to the table, isn't there? Like when we think about who we invite to our table, uh, who we want to sit at a table with, who we want to look eyeball to eyeball, there's some tension inside that because it can just be awkward when we think about having dinner, having a coffee, having a drink with certain kinds of people. And there's some obvious reasons why this brings some awkwardness and some tension into the reality. The first is this, and I don't need to spend a ton of time talking about this, but the reality here is that we don't all see the world the same way. You know, whether it comes to politics, to the way that we handle healthcare, how we dealt with COVID, how we deal with parenting, how we deal with our relationships, we know that there is a huge diversity in our world and how we see the world and how we want to walk in the world. And it's a fascinating thing, but it brings us some tension to where we're like, oh, I don't really want to like have dinner with those people. We won't say that out loud, but we feel like those people that sounds uncomfortable. Which leads me to the second point I wanna make about the awkwardness and the tension of our tables is this, that we are most comfortable with people who are most similar to us. This is obvious, right? Like we're most comfortable with people that see the world the way that we do and as uh, you know, creatures of comfort, we run towards people that we see everything the same way whether that be politics, parenting, healthcare, sports, industry, all these different things. We, we feel like we can let our hair down with people that we don't have to have the awkward conversation if we bring up the one political candidate, if we bring up the COVID vaccine. We don't feel like there's that tension that's in the room. And, and there's nothing sinful about this. There's nothing like inherently wrong about this because we all need people in that first chair next to us in our lives who are running in the same direction that we are. We need that. But I think we need to be keenly aware to where this cannot be the finish line of our relationships if our desire is to get dusty and to follow Jesus with our lives. This can be a starting line. This can be a part of our relational story, but it cannot be the finish line of our relationships because it leads to echo chambers and us being cynical and skeptical towards other people if they don't see the world that we do and we never taste the beautiful diversity that God spread across this human race. And Jesus, as we're gonna see today, he prods us. He, he, he confronts us in this nature that we have to just be around people that see everything the same way that we do. And he shows us a different way. And to get us into this, um, I'd like to pray for us. Because um, like we say at Bridgeway, every couple months, we're gonna go there this morning. And this is one of those talks I feel like I give once a year because our gravitational pull as humans and of people of faith is not to do what we're gonna talk about this morning. But I think it is so foundational to the kind of community that God's wanting us to build here. So let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the space this morning. God, um, May this just be a place um, where your grace is gonna reign. God, would you have permission to challenge us, to rearrange us, to confront some of the things that we have just fallen into, to, to see clearly your kingdom and your way of ordering life. God, may this not be a shame-filled thing, but may this be a glorious and beautiful invitation to the life that is truly the abundant life that you have for us. So God, have your way in this space. May people not be persuaded by my words, but by your spirit and the text, this book that you've given us, the scriptures. In your name we pray, amen. When I say the word hospitality, what comes to your mind? Is it the hospitality industry of hotels? Is it uh, hospitality like your spouse or your partner is like, oh, hey, my boss is coming over for dinner. I need you to pick up a veggie tray and put some beer in the fridge. Like, we need to do it right away. And it brings like stress to you thinking about uh, expressing hospitality. Like, what comes to your mind when you think of hospitality? I think in our culture, it is those kind of things. It's, okay, they're gonna be here for how long? 90 minutes to 120 minutes. And then I can put my sweatpants on and then my life can be back to normal. Like, you got the clock going in your head the whole time. Like, that's what we think of when we think of hospitality often. But in the first century, in the world of our rabbi, our Lord Jesus, hospitality was not about veggie trays and charcuterie boards. Hospitality was a command, a sacred task to welcome somebody in, to take care of them, 
to give them shelter from the storms of life. And hospitality was next to godliness for first century Jews. This is a time where there are no social safety nets to where you leave your home under your roof and your protection of your family and you're traveling. You are relying on the kindness and the compassion and the mercy and the generous hospitality of another human being. This is a time when they would only eat one big meal and it was dinner time and they would prepare it for four to six hours and then there would be two to three hours lounging around sharing stories as you enjoyed the meal. It sounds a little different than going and getting McDouble and a Coke, right? But this is the world that Jesus grew up in. This is the world that our New Testaments are swimming in that so often we lose because we think everything's just like it is in modern day America. I love what this rabbinical tradition, this teaching says about the value of hospitality in the first century. Let your home be wide open and the needy be members of your household. This sounds radical to us, right? May your home be wide open. What does this say about our security systems? I don't know. Uh, What does this say about like the needy being members of our household that we would treat them like our sons and our daughters or our plants? Like what is it like? But this just shows you the value of hospitality in this first century mindset that our rabbi and our Lord held so deeply. And we see this in the Bible. We see this in the New Testament text in the Gospels when we look at um, just the the culture around what was going on. In this one text, uh, Jesus is telling his 12 disciples to go out and do that kingdom of God thing where they're preaching the good news and they're setting people free. And we're told this, and this is some of the background here, uh, calling the 12, the disciples to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. He said, you're gonna be able to cast out demons. You're gonna be able to cast out the evil things and bring hope to people's despair, bringing peace and shalom to their chaos. And he says, these were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff or a walking stick. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not even having an extra shirt. And this is like the scariest verse in the Bible for some of my introvert friends. He says, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. This is like Cousin Eddie being like, I don't know how long I'm gonna be here, but I'm be here for a while, right? It says, you are gonna rely on the hospitality and the kindness of others. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. It's basically saying like, this shows the character of a person if they will not open up their home to you as you do God's work. Saying it's out of line with my values, Jesus is saying, if they do this. So just to show people that they're out of line, you know, kick the dust off your sandals and walk away so other people know that they're out of line as well. You see here, Jesus puts his disciples in a space where they need the generosity and the hospitality of other people to do their work. This was just the air of the first century. This was the water that our New Testaments are drenched in, radical hospitality. And this was tied into the the Jewish story, the Old Testament story, because God's people, they had once been enslaved They had once been wanderers in the desert. They'd been tossed around from superpower to superpower, always being kicked to the curb. And so they were commanded to take care of the alien, the orphan, the widow, to be hospitable to the outsider because that's what God did for them as he guided them into his way. This was baked into the cake of what it meant to be a partner with God was to be hospitable. I have a friend, uh, Nate Scott, who's on staff at a church in Logansport, Indiana, and he, he says this about hospitality. I think it's a beautiful turn of phrase. This is how we're gonna define it. Hospitality is the art of making outsiders feel like insiders. Hospitality is more than charcuterie boards, right? It's more than having some nice iced tea. It is the art of making outsiders feel like insiders. It's the art of taking people that feel like strangers and inviting them into your family, And this was the call of for God's people from the beginning of the scriptures to maps at the very end after Revelation. And Jesus practiced this so well. Everywhere he went, he didn't let the boundaries of the normal social structures uh, bind him, but he was breaking down those walls. You know, Jesus, we talked about this last week. He gave the Pharisees, these religious leaders of the time, a really difficult time. He challenged them often. But you know, he also shared meals with Pharisees. He had a late night chat with Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee of Pharisees, where Jesus said the classic John three sixteen line, that God so loved the world, you know, that whole thing. 
Jesus shared meals with them. He sat with them. He saw the whites in their eyes and had relationship with them. He did this with those religious leaders, but he also, and more notoriously did this with the outsiders, with the sinners, for the people that thought that they were on no way, shape, or form ever be invited into the fold of what God was doing in the world. He did this, and many people would say and argue that he got killed for it because he was so open arms towards the outsiders. There's no more beautiful example of how Jesus made the outsider feel like an insider than the calling of his disciple, Matthew. Now, Matthew, who wrote the very first biography of Jesus' life, Matthew, the gospel, it's the first one in our New Testament. His backstory is powerful. And in chapter nine of his gospel, he finally gets around to sharing how he had his origin story with Jesus. And we're gonna dive into the text and see this here. As Jesus went on from there, he's walking with some of his disciples. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. And I think this turn of phrase is so fascinating because Matthew is a tax collector, but it was so notorious and so scandalous for him to say that he was the tax collector here that he moves it to third person and he doesn't say he's a tax collector. He says, I was sitting at a tax collector's booth because he thinks people might think it's too conspiratorial. It's too like messy for him to say he was a tax collector because in the first century, tax collectors were considered the scum of the earth to first century Jewish people. Matthew was a Jewish man who was called to be a partner with God, to walk with God, to be a light and a blessing to the whole world. But the Roman Empire came and occupied God's people in Israel. And they locked arms with certain Jewish people to become tax collectors to extort the Jewish population. They could walk up to you and say, hey, your taxes show that you owe 100,000 denarius. So I'm gonna need you to hand that over, which is 10 lifetimes of wealth. And then if you couldn't hand it over, then you'd just be paying an extra debt with interest to the Roman Empire forever. They were traitors to God's people because they were bringing so much harm onto the Jewish people. They were considered notorious sinners, scum of the earth. When Matthew would walk around, the tax collector would be spat at by people, would have stones thrown at him. People would refuse to do business with the likes of somebody who was a tax collector. We're talking about a guy that nobody liked at all. What's scandalous is what happens next in his story. He's at the tax collector's booth. Then here's these two words from Jesus. Follow me, lek akarai, come be my disciple. And Matthew got up and followed him. Now, follow me was, we've talked about this in the first week in the series, was not just a couple words of like, hey, come be part of my posse. No, this was a rabbi saying, hey, I see you. And I want you to come be with me because I believe that you can do the things that I do. I mean, can you feel the drama of this moment? Here's Matthew who had given up the ghost, sold his soul, given up the reality of him partnering with God anymore, being in the fold of God. He's just gonna live this luxurious lifestyle as a trader and as a tax collector. And this rabbi Jesus says, come follow me. I believe in you. You better believe he left his tax collector's booth immediately (laughs) Because this rabbi says, come be with me, come be like me, come join the kingdom of God mission. You talk about an outsider being welcomed in as an insider. This was a radical transformation. And this was something so radical, you better believe there was pushback on what Jesus was doing here. And what I love next is the very next verse doesn't show that Matthew went through a discipleship course where he had to learn all the right things and he had to like get his stuff in order. He had to give away everything that he had going. He had to sell his, you know, get his tax collector's badge back in and make this huge public thing. The very next verse that we're told says this, that while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, Jesus shares a table with Matthew. He has a meal with Matthew. And this was a radical idea. He's having a meal with Matthew, but the text also tells us many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. I mean, this was a crazy thing. Can you imagine being some of the other disciples who weren't tax collectors, how uncomfortable they were in this moment? Because their mama told them not to hang out with notorious sinners. And Jesus is like, we're playing a whole different game here. And this was radical, and we're gonna see in the next couple of verses that the Pharisees, the religious teachers, had such a problem with this because there was this reality, this teaching of table fellowship in the first century. Table fellowship said this, that who you share a meal with, you approve of. Who you share a table with, you accept. Who you dip uh, your bread in the cup with at the table is someone you are in right relationship with. And Jesus is saying, I am in right relationship. I accept I approve the humanity and the image of God on the tax collectors, 
on Matthew, and on all these other notorious sinners. All these people were supposed to be on the outside from? He says, no, I have welcomed them in. And you better believe the Pharisees are upset about this. So the image we get is that the religious teachers are on the outside of the house and they're shouting in to Jesus' disciples. He says this, the Pharisees saw this and they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus is at the table probably having a grand time with his new friends. And I love this image we get. And I always picture in this moment, Jesus is being a little sarcastic. I don't know about how you like Jesus. I like my Jesus a little sarcastic sometimes. But uh, please don't take that too seriously. Uh, it, but here's what Jesus does. Jesus sort of shouts out outside of the house. And he says this. It is, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. Then he quotes the scriptures back at them. He says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. I've not come to just get my holy huddle of people that got it all together, but I've come to open up my arms to make the outsiders feel like insiders to be in the fold of what I'm doing. Now, please let me geek out and be nerdy for like three and a half minutes here. Somebody put me on the clock. What I have quoted there, Jesus quotes the scripture, says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Jesus is giving a little bit of a breadcrumb, a hint, or in the Hebrew language, what's called a remez. And this was the practice of taking an Old Testament or another scripture from across the Bible and dropping like one line that everybody in this context, because they knew their Bible so well, they'd be like, oh, that's what we're talking about. Oh, it'd bring more color. It would bring more life. It would bring more understanding to a passage because it's like a hyperlink back to another part of the Bible. What Jesus does here when he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Learn your Bible, in other words. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He's sending a hyperlink, a remez back to the Old Testament prophet of Hosea. And Hosea was speaking back in his context to the Israelite people that were called to partner with God and to be a blessing to the whole world. And he quotes back to this one passage in Hosea 6, and I'd love to read it to you because it just shows us a great example of what Jesus was saying. And I think a warning to us religious people today on how we can miss the point, how we can lose the plot. This is what Jesus is saying in full context. What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. He says, Israel, my people, what should I do with you? Your love for me has disappeared like the morning dew. It's just not there anymore. Therefore, I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I killed you with the words of my mouth. Then my judgments go forth like the sun. Here's what Jesus quoted. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice. An acknowledgement of God rather than just burnt offerings. I'm not just about keeping all the rules and making sure that we do everything by the book. This is about people. I love people and I am for people. So show mercy to people, he's saying. As at Adam or in all of humanity, they have broken the covenant. They were unfaithful to me there. They've run after other lesser gods and lesser loves. Gilead is a city of evildoers stained with footprints of blood as marauders uh, lie in ambush for a victim. So do bands of priests as people waiting to ambush and raid innocent people. These priests that are supposed to be helping people walk with God, you're just now trying to ambush people and trap people doing something wrong. Jesus is just telling these Pharisees, you guys have lost the plot. You've missed the point. Here's my warning to us from this. We're in church this morning. People, we are gatekeepers to the love of God for so many people. May we not ever get so caught up in the way we do church, in the way that we interpret the Bible, in the way that we hold the message of God. May we not hold it so tightly that we forget that it is a gift for people to enjoy. And may we always open up doors for people and be people that are known by mercy, not just by being right. Stepping off of soapbox now. But I think that's the warning Jesus wants to give us. But Jesus practiced this art of hospitality, of letting the outsider in to become an insider often. He says that my kingdom is upside down. It's not about people that you agree with. If you're a Fox News person, it's not just about being all Fox News all the time. If you're an MSNBC person, it's not about just being in relationship with the MSNBC people all the time. It's more than that. Another element that Jesus speaks into our relationships and having dusty relationships It's just the type of people that he called to be his disciples makes no sense why it would ever work. I wanna look at the the list of the 12 disciples and show you a little bit of who they were and their worldviews that were competing worldviews that Jesus put together. Matthew records this in chapter 10. 
These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip, and Bartholomew. Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. And Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, we lose so much of this because we just see a list of names. But you guys, there's no way on earth that these people would ever be called into the same room with each other without there being blood shed. But I think Jesus, on purpose and for a purpose, calls these men together. They have competing worldviews, and Jesus wants to show us that there's, there is a possibility to have unity without holding uniformity. And he wants us to aim for cultivating unity and not just aiming for uniformity. You see, there's different worldviews here. Now, as the rise of Hellenism and the Roman Empire spread all over the world, Jewish people in the first century were trying to wrestle with what it meant to actually follow this Jesus. How can we be faithful to this Jesus when Rome and Greco-Roman culture was spreading everywhere? And so there there were different schools of thought to how we approach culture and how we follow God. And they're all represented inside of this passage. You see, there was the the, uh, Pharisee. The Pharisee worldview inside of this was probably held by Peter, James, and John. They were in the religious triangle where people thought that we just need to follow all the rules. We'll put fences around certain rules to make sure we're not even close to breaking commands. And God's gonna like defeat Rome and God's gonna bring his kingdom if we all just hunker down and we follow all the commands and we're obedient. Peter, James, and John were probably coming from that Pharisaical worldview. And so they're there and they're there in this group with Matthew, the tax collector, Someone who had more of a Herodian worldview or the idea of like, we need to mix culture and our faith background together and it's all good. And here's the tax collector, Matthew, who is considered a traitor to God's people and the Pharisees having to hang out with Matthew there. There's another worldview in this time called the Essene worldview. And they were kind of the doomsday preppers of this time to where they like thought, we need to remove ourselves from all the corruption and all the sin and all the debauchery. We're gonna move out to like this place called Qumran in the desert. And we're just gonna like write the Bible and memorize the Bible and spend time together in this holy huddle to where we're not you know, tied down by any of this stuff. And many people believe that Andrew might be a, uh, in a scene and Philip because they were connected to John the Baptist. Remember the crazy guy, you know, who ate, ate the locust? He was out in the wilderness all the time preaching about the end of the world. Like they, they were his followers before Jesus. So they think that they had this Essene worldview to where they were like, stay away from people. And then you had zealots. You had Simon the zealot in that list. And then you had Judas, who many scholars believe might be a, a zealot because of his last name being tied to a zealot weapon as well. And zealots were the terrorists, the insurgents of the day. They thought the only way for the kingdom of God to finally come on earth is if they killed all the Roman oppressors. So they had these Sicarii knives underneath their sleeves and they would stab the Roman soldiers when nobody was looking. This is the good stuff you come to church for, right? But these zealots thought that there was this thing called redemptive violence. That if we just killed everybody, then peace was going to come. Sound familiar? All of these worldviews were represented in that 12 person list. Talk about competing worldviews, right? But Jesus chose them on purpose and for a purpose. And like we read earlier, Jesus sent them out two by two. Can you imagine who Jesus set up on the two by two? A zealot and an Essene. Someone who thinks we're gonna bring war on people and then people think we just need to stay away. Tax collector and the Pharisees. I mean, can you imagine the arguments? Can you imagine the prejudice? Can you imagine the judgment? Can you imagine all the awkward mealtimes when nobody's making eye contact and there's all the little subtexting going on in the corner or there's like the times they're traveling and they just hate each other and and there's just all this animosity between them, the awkward silence. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus put these people together on purpose to teach them something about the kind of community that he's building, to teach them to teach us the kind of community that looks dusty, the kind of friendships that are dusty. Community that fights for unity above uniformity. That's what he did with his first disciples. So let's go back to that ancient Jewish blessing that we've been talking about all series long. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. So what does it look like for us to have dusty relationships? Relationships that are, you know, defined by our hospitality and making outsiders insiders. Relationships that are defined by people being with us that are different than us. What does it look like to have dusty relationships? I have some challenges for you, some thoughts for you. The first one is this, and we just were just talking about this a second ago. Dusty relationships cultivate unity, but not uniformity. 
Dusty relationships take people that see the world differently. And Jesus never asked these disciples to like throw away everything that they believe, but he said that I want my calling you to be my disciple, my son, my daughter, to supersede all those things to where that soaks down into everything in your life. Jesus asked people to have unity around him instead of just trying to get people that believe everything the same about the world. So let me ask you some uncomfortable questions. For you, do you have friends who voted for a member of the other team in the last election? Like friends that you can sit at a table with, you can look at each other in the eyes and share a meal, share a drink, share a coffee, and there's just joy there instead of judgment? Do you have people like that? Can you hold unity above this need for uniformity? Do you have friends who walk through COVID radically differently than you did and you think they're a sheep and they think that you don't care about other people? Like, do you have friends that you can sit with and you love and you spur each other on to good works? Do you have friends that, um, that, I'm, that you know would disagree about student debt relief that you can sit with at a table? Like, okay, sidebar, who's excited for Thanksgiving? Let's go, it's gonna be perfect and really easy and smooth. Do you have friends like that? Jesus says that dusty relationships hold space for disagreement and hold the large things large and let the other things go. Not that they don't matter, but that they won't change relationship. A couple other challenges for you. Dusty relationships are marked by curiosity. And curiosity is the soil that humility works in. Dusty relationships are marked by curiosity. My son, Jack, who's three, uh, he asks me about, you know, seven to 10 questions the first five minutes. I'm in the door like, what does that word mean? What's that? And then it's always, I'll say, well, it's, it's called a beetle. It's a bug. It's a beetle. And he goes, why'd they call it a beetle? And I'm like, I don't know the etymology. I'll look it up later. Like, but he's so curious about things. And it was funny as we were all curious and then life kicked it out of us. What if the name Christian, the name Christ follower starts to be tied with others oh, curious. They wanna understand. They wanna seek to understand things about people instead of judgment. This is what's so powerful about curiosity. Curiosity is like the fruit of humility, saying that you don't have it all figured out, you don't understand everything. Instead of building up walls, curiosity starts to tear down walls brick by brick when we seek to understand, and we don't seek to come at people with a knife or a bat to break them down, but we just wanna understand them more. Can we become curious people again? Jesus was curious. You know, Jesus asked over 500 questions in the Gospels, and he answered 29 of them. 500 questions he asked. He answered 29 questions. He was curious. Let's be like our rabbi and our Lord, Jesus, in our relationships. Next, uh, dusty relationships are marked by kindness. And we always got to do a little stop here because in the Midwest, uh, we, we equate kindness with niceness all the time. We're like, oh, he's nice, she's nice, and even when we don't mean it. But like kindness is so much more robust than niceness. Uh, my friend Brent Faulkner, who's one of the pastors at Crossroads Church here in Kokomo, he says this about kindness. I think this is beautiful. Kindness is the outward face of unconditional love. Kindness is what love looks like with flesh and bones on it. It's the outward face of what it looks like in the streets, in our relationships. And this is what we're called to. This is what Jesus gave us. I love what Andy Stanley says about kindness. We say this all the time. Kindness is letting someone borrow your strength instead of reminding them of their weakness. When it's so easy to remind them of what's wrong with them. (laughs) Kindness is letting them borrow your strength. And you don't have to remind them of their weakness. Just give, serve. Kindness leads you to a spirit of empathy. Kindness leads you to a spirit of service, a posture of how can I serve you? How can I subject myself to you? Man, our relationships as Jesus followers need to be marked by kindness. And lastly, dusty people with dusty relationships always have an open seat at the table. Our circle, our tribe, our people, there always has to be an open seat at the table. There's something, I don't think we say out loud, but if you've lived in the same town for a long time, the same kind of community, you're like, friends, I got them, I'm good. And you like close yourself off from new relationships and new stories that your story can be intertwined with. The way of Jesus was this outward sort of searching, head on a swivel all the time for the least, the last, the lost, the left behind, the lonely. And dusty people do the same thing. 
We don't get so concerned with the people we know that we forget other people, but we're so driven by this welcome from our Savior that we're always looking out ahead on a swivel for those who are alone. So if you're in a table group already, and so many of you guys are in a table group here at the church, is our version of small groups, man, don't get so inward focused that it's all a holy huddle, but be looking for other people that you can include and welcome in, because we don't have closed groups here. There's always another seat at our table groups here. And if you haven't joined a table group yet, uh, man, just like Kristen said earlier, we would encourage you to try it, to get with some people that are your running partners, people walking in the same direction as you, people that you can encourage, you can love, that you can walk through life with. It is something that you will never, ever regret because you were created for this kind of community. I challenge you with that. As we close the whole series, um, this is so important. About once a year, I give a talk from this lens because, again, our gravitational pull as people is to just run towards people that are just like us and build fences and walls between us and people that see the world differently. And so we talk about this about once a year, and I'm so passionate about it because this is the kind of community that we're building. This is the kind of community that we are becoming here at Bridgeway. There's open tables to be with the other, whatever the other means to you. We are a politically diverse church, and we're going to stay that way. People that see the order of uh, power differently, that's who we are here. And we encourage people to vote their Christ, um, their law of Christ informed conscious and however that plays out. But yes, we're a politically diverse church. We're a culturally diverse church and we wanna grow in that more and more and have so much room to grow in that culturally and ethnically. We're a theologically diverse church. We hold space in humility that there are a lot of people that interpret the scriptures differently than we do. And there have been Christ followers throughout the ages that understand the scriptures maybe differently than I do or you do. And we hold space for that. If we're following Jesus, we're all trying to figure that out. But this is the kind of community that we're becoming. I think the question for you is, who is on the other side of you to where you're like, no, I can get behind this whole love thing. I can get behind this whole hospitality thing, but not them, not them, not this group. Um, I was challenged by this artist's rendering and I saw on social media a couple months back of Jesus washing the feet of a bunch of different people. And some of the pictures, man, they were, they were, they were challenging to me. <laughs> but I wanna run through some of these pictures and let it challenge you as well. Who do you feel like God's love and God's acceptance and God's him serving them is off limits because of them? Let's run through these pictures together. First, we see an addict. So the beer bottles, the pill bottles. But our rabbi, our savior, Jesus, he, he would serve him. He would get down on his level and intimately wash his feet. That's who our Jesus is. But would we? Or is that too messy for us to deal with? There's another picture here. Somebody saying, Roe has to go. Someone who's holding uh, the, a, more of a pro-life stance, if you want to use that language, of restricting abortion rights. And that might be visceral to you in the room, because I know we've got diversity of thought and opinion about this. But would you be able, if you hold a different opinion from this, would you be able and would you wash their feet, even if you saw the abortion rights conversation differently? Jesus would. And he beckons us to as well. Next. Oh, but let's go there, though. President Trump. And again, we're a politically diverse church. This elicits lots of different responses. Jesus would wash this man's feet. Jesus sees the image of God on this man's life. Would you say that God's love is not strong enough or God's love doesn't reach this man? I think Jesus would say otherwise. Next, other side of the coin, President Joe Biden. Jesus would wash this man's feet. Jesus would serve him in an intimate way. Even if there's some disagreement on policy from him or President Trump, would you? Or you keep them at an arm's length? For us to be dusty, it shouldn't matter. Let's keep it going. There's somebody with a rainbow flag, maybe a member of the LGBTQ community, or maybe someone who's fighting for the rights of our gay brothers and sisters. Jesus would wash this man's feet. Jesus would serve this man 
in an intimate way and extend his love and his grace to him? Would you? If not, what's standing in your way? Because this is what Jesus did for us. A couple more. A convict. We don't know what he did. Maybe our mind goes to the worst possible scenario. <laughs> we think, oh, it's dangerous. It's, oh, he's evil. All these different things that come through our minds. But Jesus would serve this man. He sees the image of God in this man's life. He sees his potential more than just his rap sheet. Would you, or would that be too scary, too messy? What does love require of you with this? And one more, law enforcement agent. Jesus would serve them, serves them. Nothing is too messy or too up in arms for his love and for him to intimately serve this person. The challenge is, For us not just to believe this stuff about Jesus, but let's apprentice this Jesus who breaks down all these walls and welcomes the outsider in as an insider. This is who Jesus is calling us to be. And you guys, this is the stuff that changes the world. So let's be people that get dusty like our savior, like our rabbi, to spread this love, to spread this grace, to spread this radical hospitality that looks at people that are considered outsiders and welcomes them in spreads this radical inclusivity to where it's not just about uniformity, but it's about unity. And we can learn to live with each other despite our differences. This is who we're becoming as a church. And I want to invite you to join us. This is what it means to be covered in the dust of our rabbi.